Some folks say that you ought not mess with an Appalachian woman if you know what's good for you. Today we have a story that tends to prove that saying is absolutely correct. Hello folks, I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories, A History of Appalachia. You know, Steve, we really have to look at that, and we really need to think about it. We really shouldn't mess with an Appalachian woman, you know, if we know what's good for us. Um, I learned that lesson a long time ago, Rod. <laughs> I haven't quite learned that lesson just yet, so I, I don't know if it's the fact that my Appalachian woman's kind of still playing around with me before she finally lowers the axe on me. I don't know what she's going to do, but still... I guess live and learn. You've learned that a long time ago. I've still got a ways to go, I suppose. Oh, goodness. Well, all joking aside, yeah, that saying does really hold a lot of weight, particularly in the story we're going to tell you today. And uh, that story is about a woman named Frankie Silver who lived in western North Carolina in the early part of the 19th century. Frankie, born Francis Stewart to Isaiah and Barbara Stewart, was married to Charles Silver, and lived with her husband near Kona in what's now Mitchell County, then Burke County, along with the couple's one-year-old daughter, Nancy. Things weren't going well for the young couple. According to some stories, Frankie had become jealous of Charles, possibly seeing other women. But other stories indicate that Charles was simply a controlling and abusive husband. Well, for whatever reason, Problems between the two came to a head late December of 1831 when Frankie approached her mother and saying that Charles had gone out hunting with a friend by the name of George Young a few days earlier and hadn't returned. Well, Frankie and Charlie's father went out and looking for Charlie the next day and approached Mr. Young, who told the two that he hadn't seen Charlie in quite a while and that certainly... <laughs> He hadn't gone hunting with anybody, or at least not recently. Well, John returned to the cabin and found Charlie's dog, which he always took with him wherever he went and also whenever he went hunting, and he soon became suspicious. So suspicious that he called the sheriff, and the sheriff in turn came out, began poking around the cabin, and with some of the neighbors of the Silvers, they were looking around to see if they could find something that would tell them what in the world might be going on? While doing so, one of the searchers, Jack Collis, found greasy ashes and bone pieces in the fireplace. Yeah, you kind of get my drift where we're going here, okay? And then found human bone fragments buried around the yard and in the woods. This, along with other evidence in the house, led the authorities to believe that Frankie had simply decapitated her husband, chopped up his body, and then burned it in the fireplace and then tried to dispose of the remains. She was arrested on January 10, 1832 for Charlie Silver's murder and placed in the Burke County, North Carolina jail. Now, Steve, one thing that I'd want to say about this is maybe the sheriff and maybe some of the other people weren't used to this or something, but, you know, you would think that there would have been a distinct kind of smell to a human being, you know, singed hair, something that's been burned before, but nothing about that is mentioned or anything, but, you know, the suspicions finally did bode true when they found those greasy fragments and those ashes in the fireplace and the bones buried around the yard. Well, Frankie went to trial, and it was held in Morganton before Judge John R. Donnell in late March. After two days of testimony, the all-male jury was deadlocked, nine to three, in favor of acquittal. They asked to rehear the testimony of some witnesses, but as they waited, well, the jury was allowed to mingle, and they discussed the case. After hearing from the witnesses again, they reached a verdict. Frankie Silver was found guilty of murder in a unanimous vote. She was sentenced to be hanged for the killing at the June session of court that year, but her lawyers appealed her case to the North Carolina Supreme Court, which didn't hear the case till that summer. Her appeal was denied, and the case was sent back to the Burke County Superior Court so that a new date for execution could be set. Since Judge Swain failed to appear in court in September because he'd taken a pretty bad tumble from his horse, the fall court term was canceled, and Frankie's sentencing was delayed until the following March term. And by the way, Rod, Judge Swain 
was also running for governor of North Carolina that fall, an office he won in the November election. Wow. Well, after she had been tried and convicted, the people of Burke County ended up rallying to her cause. More than 200 of them, including the clerk of the court and members of the jury that had convicted her, and even her jailer, petitioned Governor Swain to spare her life. Among the arguments that they made to the governor was that the judge in the case, John R. Donnell, had improperly allowed the jurors to re-examine witnesses after those witnesses had discussed the case together after their first testimony. A clear violation of court rules which are in place to keep witnesses from changing their testimony to echo other witnesses or to just flat out lie. Well, this was the basis for Frankie's appeal, which the Supreme Court upheld notwithstanding for this evidence. And neither the current governor, Montfort Stokes, nor his successor, the aforementioned former judge, David L. Swain, saw fit to grant her a pardon. Rod, her fate was sealed, leaving only one way out. In June of 1833, just ten days before she was to be hanged, Frankie escaped from jail, supposedly with the aid of her father and her uncle. Whoever it was that helped her, that person or persons entered the jail by way of a window. Then, with fake keys, they opened the doors leading to Frankie's cell. Her freedom was short-lived, though. A sheriff's posse found Frankie, her father, and her uncle trying to make their getaway in a hay wagon. Seems that Frankie was in the hay, her hair cut short and dressed in men's clothing, until she got out of sight. Then she walked beside the wagon. Now, someone in the posse yelled at her, saying, Frankie. She called back to them in a deep voice, saying, I thank you, sir, but my name is Tommy. Her uncle then added, Yeah, her name is Tommy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> saying her gave him away, duh. So back to jail she went. Her father and uncle were also arrested and put in jail as accessories to the escape. Although it's disputed that she did so, the Fayetteville Observer on July 30th, 1833, reported that Frankie had made a confession of all the circumstances leading to the commission of the awful deed, from which it appears that the whole period of her matrimonial life was spent in a succession of quarrels and fights, always, as she says, commenced by her worthless partner. She says he was loading his gun with the avowed purpose of shooting her, when she caught up the axe and gave him the fatal blow. A few moments afterward, she would have given, she says, a thousand worlds to have called back that blow. Now, whether this is true or not is in dispute, though, okay? What is known is that she never made a public confession to the crime, nor was she permitted to testify against Charles at trial, a common practice at the time. Now, many feel that she was the victim of horrible abuse at the hands of her husband, which is to what led to such an outpouring of sympathy for her and the attempt to have the governor pardon her. Well, for some reason not recorded, Frankie's execution was again delayed and set for July 12th, but this time Frankie was hanged, becoming the first woman to be executed in Burke County, North Carolina. Frankie tried to make a final statement, but her father drowned her out by shouting, Die with it in you, Frankie! And she did exactly what her daddy told her to do. Just what she was planning to say, we'll never know. Well, after her death, Mr. Stewart planned on bringing Frankie's body home to be buried in the family plot. But the extreme heat and humidity in the area that year forced him to abandon those plans and to bury her in an unmarked grave behind the Buckthorn Tavern just west of Morganton. For many years, the exact location was unknown, but it's now believed to have been located with a granite marker placed there by Beatrice Cobb, the editor of the Morganton newspaper in 1952. The Stewart family itself appeared to be cursed, as three other members of the family met with violent deaths. Frankie's father, Isaiah, was killed by a falling limb from a tree he was cutting. Her mother died from a snake bite, and her brother Blackston was hanged for stealing a horse in Kentucky. And what about Charles Silver? Well, he actually has three separate graves located in the Silver Family Cemetery 
behind Kona Baptist Church in Kona, North Carolina. You see, all of his body was not found at the same time. So as they found those parts of him, they buried them separately with three separate services. And there is a marker in front of all three of those small markers indicating that's his burial site. Wow. Well, you might be asking the question, what happened to little Nancy? Well, nobody really knows for sure, but stories are told that she was taken to her Stewart relatives in Macon County to be raised up, while others say that her silver residents and, you know, 10 people took her and brought her up too. Well, one story has her marrying a man named David Parker and having several children with him, all of whom were taken in after Mr. Parker was killed during the Civil War, which devastated Nancy. She did, according to a story, remarry and was reunited with her children in the 1870s. Now, the second husband, William C. Robinson, is said to have assaulted Nancy's daughter, causing her to run him off and change her name back to Parker. And Nancy is buried in the Mount Grove Cemetery in Macon County under her first husband's name is Nancy Parker. There you go, Rod, the story of Frankie Silver, a very tragic story. Whatever she was suffering, whatever happened, she, I guess, either just flipped out at the moment or felt she had to do something to protect herself and her daughter, and she paid the ultimate Mm -hmm. price for it. Yeah, it's just, you know, and one of these things, too, this is, you know, this was one of those cases, too, of, you know, um, abuse, uh, spousal abuse mm-hmm. that happened back in the early 1800s. Folks, you got to realize something. Uh, it was unheard of for a woman to actually stand up and do something about it. What they ended up doing was, in a lot of cases, they ended up taking it unless there was an unfortunate accident that did not fall back on someone before it was all said and done. Uh, so, you know, she, if that's what she really did, and she was abused, she took things into her own hands, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't end up helping her in the end, although she knows what the real story was and what the truth was altogether. As we said in the beginning, Rod, don't mess with an Appalachian woman. Exactly. And folks, that's the story of the hanging of Frankie Silver. Another bit of the history of this place we call home. Thanks for watching. Till next we meet, y'all take care. So long, everybody. So long.